Hello, party people, and welcome to Haines, Alaska. We're here for a bear viewing tour off of our Alaskan cruise, but of course, as luck would have it, there weren't actually any bears out today. Uh, my hair is an absolute mess because I had a hat on all day, and then I left the hat over in the bus, so there we are. So let's see, the top voted question is from James who asks, uh, when you were an employee, how did you decide whether to move on to another job? Okay, me personally, I feel like I always waited too long. I feel like I look back and I go, I probably should have cut a lot earlier. Um, but I'm one of those people who I really want to give something every last chance to say that I really tried before I move on to something else. Um, the, the one thing that I would say is, is even if you're happy with your work, you should commit to doing a job interview every six months at minimum, if not every three months. It's going to keep you sharp at your interviewing skills, and it's also going to open you up to opportunities that you never would have had otherwise. The best time to find your next job is when you're already happily employed. Because after all, it, employers kind of want people who are in demand and have good skills, so you'll come off better, you'll interview better, uh, it'll just work out much better for you. Uh, next up, we have Kdeta, who asks, Hi Brent, can you point us to what the best practice pattern is for a simple full table refresh ETL job? You shouldn't be doing that. If you're extracting the whole table every time your job runs, you are doing it wrong, period, full stop. You need to only transfer the parts of the table that have changed, like the rows that have changed, and that's it. Otherwise, if you keep recopying the same data over and over again, it's called the Groundhog Day ETL pattern, and you will have a bad time. Uh, next up, Bandu asks, uh, in a SQL VM, is it better to retire excess CPU cores or should you turn on compression in order to utilize the excess cores? You always want to step, step back and ask, what's the problem that I'm trying to solve? If you're just trying to burn CPU for no reason, step back and ask, what would you do if you were the company and you had extra licenses sitting around? You'd want to stop using those so that you didn't have to keep paying for it, you didn't have to pay software assurance, you could move down to smaller VM sizes, uh, server sizes, etc. So don't just try and do idle work in order to uh, keep the thing busy, just downsize the CPUs. Uh, next up, Urzabet says, what are the best and, use, best and worst use cases you've seen in the field for SQL CLR? Now, the only best case that I've really seen, best cases that I've really seen, have involved doing something really CPU intensive that needed to live near the data. And I'll give you an example, regular expressions. SQL Server doesn't have regular expressions built in, uh, so I've seen people use SQL CLR when they really wanted to do regex searches across the data. Whether or not you should do that is probably a, a really good question. And in terms of the worst ones, I, the, the general problem with SQL CLR is that people don't know how to do memory troubleshooting. And if you don't know how to troubleshoot memory leaks in your CLR code, well then for God's sakes, don't put your CLR code on the SQL server where troubleshooting memory leaks is going to be very painful and expensive for you. Uh, next up, Frank says, I uh, loved your cloud training course. Oh, very cool. Glad to hear it. Uh, follow up, how bad is connection stability nowadays compared to on-premises? It's terrible. Um, you, just generally speaking, you shouldn't expect uh, your connections to be bulletproof reliable anywhere, whether we're talking about on-premises or the cloud. So as he follows up, with, I, or I read early horror stories from the early days of Azure SQL, is hardening the client code with retry logic ever, everywhere still needed? Yes, absolutely, because it doesn't matter whether you're doing failover clustering, always on availability groups, uh, log shipping, replication. SQL Server has no built-in failover methods that don't require retrying your connection. So by all means, it is something that you want to get used to doing. 
Yousef asks, we need to regularly update our first responder kit installs. Is the same also true for Ola Hollingren's maintenance scripts and SP who is active? Both of those have kind of fallen out of active development. They're what I would consider feature complete. And so their authors rarely update them. Usually you only see updates for those every couple of years. If you want to know when does it, which uh, software does it make sense to update regularly though, I would just say, yes, you should be updating your software regularly. Shahid says, what is your opinion of workload tools for capturing and replaying SQL workloads? I've never used it, so I couldn't speak to that one at all. Wilson asks, hi Brent, I have a SQL job scheduled to run at 7.30, but after rebooting, the schedule changes for 7.30 a.m. Any idea what's going on? I have absolutely no idea what's going on there. Um, generally, I, what I would do is I would probably grab screenshots before and after uh, and post that on dba.stackexchange because um, it, it smells like what you probably have there is a job that's set to run every 12 hours starting at a certain time and then you're just seeing flips with it, but without seeing those screenshots. I can't tell you how many times in my career somebody said, oh, trust me, this is what it is. And then as soon as I've had them show me that we've been like, oh, yeah, that's not what it is. So, And then we'll do one more. Rose Noble asks, what are your pros and cons for long-term versus short-term DBA contracting? Well, just generally with long-term work, you don't have to sell it as often. You get one contract and you're done, and then you can keep getting paid for that for a long period of time. Short-term contracting, if you have to keep reselling to new clients, that means you need a steady income stream of new clients constantly coming in, which is going to mean more work for you for marketing, more work for you for sales and uh, unpredictability. Um, Long-term contracting also can mean putting all your eggs in one basket, and when that contract suddenly comes apart, you may not have other sales leads. Um, not to say that short-term is more reliable. If the market dries up, if your marketing efforts don't work out well, you can suddenly be facing a lack, lack of clients as well. Long-term work tends to be lower revenue, but more predictable. Short-term work tends to be more high-priced, uh, but less predictable. So like I specialize in emergency performance tuning, I rarely know what I'm going to be doing a month from now. Like my calendar is usually empty one or two months at most. Sometimes there are times when I don't know what I'm doing next week, uh, but the emergencies seem to keep finding me, so that is what it is. Uh, also, I guess one other thing with uh, short-term work is that you can take off whenever you want to. You just schedule vacations uh, like right now. So I just put a hole in my calendar, said I'm going to go take a vacation on these dates, uh, and then off we went. So speaking of which, now we're going back on vacation. There's a, a, some seafood ready for me over there. Uh, we're out on this bear watching tour where we didn't actually see any bears. No, no offense at all. I've been on bear watching tours before and did see bears. I know how unpredictable this kind of thing can be. Um, tomorrow is our last uh, excursion day out here in Alaska. We're pulling into Ketchikan, Alaska, one of my favorite cute little towns, um, and doing float planes. We're going to hop on a float plane and go do uh, uh, some flight seeing around glaciers and mountains. Love that. I have a fear of heights of one to two stories up. Like, I don't like ladders at all. But planes and helicopters don't buy, or zip lines too. We did a big, huge zip line. You might have seen on my TikTok. Huge, massive zip line, a uh, quarter mile down, 60 mile an hour run uh, uh, over a bunch of trees. And I, that didn't bother me at all. It was fantastic. I, it was exciting for sure. But uh, for some reason, big heights don't bother me, but small heights bother the heck out of me. So hope you had fun and learned something. And I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.